Hi everyone, there's a lot going on. I wanted to talk to you guys about the Jupiter opposition today, which is, hasn't happened since 1963, and that Jupiter is going to be the brightest and closest it's been to Earth since then. And I also want to talk about the Fiona hurricane that hit Canada and the etymology of that and how that's all referencing uh, back to the Divine Feminine and to Wales. And also I want to talk about Venus and how Venus is going to be going into the Black Star position and getting out of her Lucifer position. So there's a lot to go over. I'm going to try to you know, compact this as much as I can and not go read through everything so that you guys can get through this a little quicker. But uh, it's exciting because everything's coming full circle and it's all tying into the Olympics in 2024 because that's, you know, we know that's the logo is for Jupiter and the significance of Jupiter's placement in 2024. I'm starting to understand why it's so much more important than I originally thought. And so we're, I've also picked a date in uh, 2024 that is really significant. It ties into Trump's birthday. So we've got a lot to go through. So uh, hang in there tight. It's uh, crazy how everything is starting to connect. It's, it's friggin' amazing. They're stating here that it was in October 1963 and it won't happen again to 2,129. So they specify the opposition is that when the sun is at the helical rising and at the west, on the descendant, Jupiter is in opposition, like right across from the sun. So you can see this happened in October, right when the sun was on the Washington Monument star, which is Spica, in the Virgin, in Virgo. And that's really significant because we're coming up to you know, that time again when the sun is in Virgo. And on October 17th in 1963, we had a new moon right on the Spica star. And 1963 is a significant year because that's the year that JFK was shot, right? The king was shot. So here, I'm just showing you how we now have a new moon. In September, it actually happened yesterday on September 25th. There was a new moon conjunct Venus. And this is significant because it's Venus kissing the moon or the moon kissing Venus. It's like it takes a little chunk out of Venus and they overlap, they conjunct each other. Jupiter is really the god of this realm. He rules the ninth house of higher learning. He also rules uh, Pisces, the 12th house with Neptune, which has to do with your psyche. Okay, so his symbol, his alchemic symbol, it looks like the number 24 and this is really relevant because this is the symbol they've chosen for the Paris 2024 Olympics. Now why is it in Paris? It's in Paris because it all goes back to the Knights of Templars right and the crusade that all ties in to the Catholic Church and the kings, okay? The kings were fighting a little bit, like we're, we're starting to fight the Catholic Church and, you know, they kind of got into the middle of these two warring factions, the Templars, and they ended up, you know, being killed because nobody could agree with, you know, their heresy and what they had done or supposedly done and they just wanted to get rid of them because they were getting wealthy and they were like starting to have more wealth than the kings and the, the the pope right so there was all this going on so anyhow i'm going to tie this all in but that's why everything is so important with with paris and france and i'll go into the history way way back about the tribes that actually ruled in paris um, you know way back in antiquity so it's really significant because this is why everything is is going around paris and then we also have um you know this other part of the USA Great Eclipse is also happening 2024 on April 8th, right? So the year 2024 is huge significance. It's, it's like I always knew it was, but it's like getting more intense because what's happening now is confirming, you know, the importance of that year. Okay? It all ties into the Fiona hurricane. Now, what's fascinating is that this eclipse in 2024 is happening in Pisces that's ruled by Jupiter. Right, and it's the right fish of Jupiter of uh, Pisces, which I believe is the 
the fish of Christ. It's representing the crown of Christ, that right fish. It's like a pentagon and it's called the circlet of Pisces. I've explained this before in other videos. So there's a huge significance, the fact that it's happening in Pisces that's ruled by Jupiter. Okay, so you can start to see that it's all intermingling um, in, in basically worshiping Jupiter. Okay, and this ties into Paris. It ties into the Notre Dame church where they um, decided to kill uh, Jacques Molay, the, the, um, the leader of the Templars. Okay, so it's all tying into Notre Dame and it just goes on and on because everywhere I look in Quebec, because I live in Quebec, Canada, almost every town has a street named Notre Dame, okay, which is Our Lady. Okay, so it's always tying back to the, to the Divine Feminine and um, that's significant. I love the timing when you guys send me stuff. Gail sent me this today, and it's a little clip about JFK talking about uh, being able to control weather in the future. I'll propose further cooperative efforts between all the nations in weather prediction and eventually in weather control. So my theory is nothing's random. Okay, so I was just at Ile de Magdalene, exactly where this hurricane went through. And I was there because I had something pulling me there, all to tie into, you know, the Virgin Mary, Our Lady, Notre Dame. Okay, so that's why I was pulled there to go there. So it doesn't surprise me that this hurricane went there because it's like they want to put trauma into the divine feminine line. Okay, which is to do with Gaia, you know, Mother Earth. It's um, also to do with your service to um, to serve uh, and sacrifice yourself. Okay, like you're going to sacrifice yourself in service. Okay, so it's like they're putting this storm energy into that. So I want to go over uh, the etymology of the name Fiona. Okay, so Fiona is it is identical to the Scots Gaelic word for wine, but it is sometimes said to be the Scots Gaelic fion, white, also fair. And the Old Irish uh, find windos, white, which would make it a cognate with Welsh Gwen or Gwendolyn. So Gwendolyn, I believe, is like the, the white lady of the lake. And you can see it in the etymology of the word. Gwen means white, and then Lynn means lake, which I always said, like Lincoln, it has to tie in with the lake. So here I was in Ile de Magdalene and making the Venus star on the beach, collecting shells, which is Venus, and going in the, you know, the white um, froth of the, of the sea, which all ties into the birth of Venus. So I knew that this island, because of the name Ile de Magdalene, was really tied to the divine feminine which all goes back to France because, you know, Magdalene was uh, in the caves in France and she was doing her work and healing um, people in, in discretion because, you know, she was going to be killed as a healer, right? If you were healing people, basically you were burnt at the stake or considered to be a witch. Now, at one point they were saying the winds were 144 kilometers, the number of 144 came up, the circle on the left of the Ile de Magdalene, and then the, it was hit really hard at Porto Basque. And then this island called St. Pierre um, and um, Medellin was very important. Uh, this is all tying into virgins as well with the sainthood of uh, Ursula. Okay, so I want to just briefly go into that because it's all about the divine feminine, all in this area that Jacques Cartier. Um, you know, found Jacques Cartier uh, being a Frenchman and naming Ile de Magdalene and, you know, finding out that these were ancient islands that the uh, Migwa nations were, were there for years, well, thousands of years before. Islands battered by waves was their name for it. It's called Dawnland. The whole area is called Dawnland, right? So it's like the dawn being you know, the uh, goddess, the dawn goddess, which is Aurora, right? So it's like, it's all fascinating because it all comes back to the divine feminine. So there's salt domes uh, that are believed 
to be sources of fossil fuels. Rock salt is mined on these islands. And I was talking to a lady when I was there, and she was saying it's really weird that she, she had done all the research that the French cultures were always in areas where there's lots of salt in the ground. And she thought that was really bizarre. Um, and we were talking about the name of the island because they do call it um, Ile de Madeleine, but Jacques Cartier called it Ile de Magdalene. But when I was looking at the news in Canada when this Fiona was going through, they were referencing it as Ile de Magdalene. So they were basically just showing you right in your face that this is, you know, what this is all about um, is the divine feminine. Jacques Cartier was the first known European to visit the islands. Um, and they're talking about the hundreds of years of past seasonal subsidence migration from the natives it was probably to harvest walrus population. Then they're talking about uh, the first concentrated settlement attempt was made by English Puritan separatist Francis Johnson in 1597, which failed. There are English speaking people on a couple of the islands. And in 19, sorry, 1765, the islands were inhabited by 22, the famous number, right? The fool card, French speaking Acadians and their families. Okay, so the Acadian is really like the. Uh, the 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 sacred land, all the East Coast, you know, was where the the Indians and the French speaking people were living in harmony. Okay, so it was harmonious, and they were happy living together and helping each other, and there was no fighting. So some of the islanders and descendants of survivors of more than four hundred shipwrecks are on these islands. Okay, so then some of the the houses were built from the shipwrecks. Um, until the 20th century, the islands were completely isolated during a winter since the pack ice made from a trip to the mainland impassable by boat. The islands had no mean of communication with the mainland. An underwater cable was installed to ensure communication by telegraph, but in the winter of 1910, the cables broke and the islands were again isolated. So often they're isolated. It's like this isolated island, and it's like this island that is like, uh, it's like divine there. It's like crazy. It's just so beautiful. Um, and anyhow, their flag has the Venus star on it. Okay, it's no coincidence that that's what you know. It's all to do with the feminine. So the other island that's in that area is called Saint Pierre Island Group of the Eleven Thousand Virgins, as the day marked of the feast day of Saint Ursula and her virgin companions. Jacques Cartier claimed the islands for the French possession on behalf of the King of France. Though already frequently frequented by the Micmac uh, people and by the Basque and the Breton fishermen, the islands were not permanently settled until the end of the 17th century. Four permanent inhabitants were counted in 1670 and 22 in 1691. Here's number 22 again. So when you start looking into St. Ursula, it's crazy. Um, it's... Her legend is that she was going to marry a pagan governor, okay? His name was Conrad Muradoc of Amorica, Amorica, not America. And um, after a miraculous storm brought them over the sea in a single day to the Gaulish port, Ursula declared that before her marriage, she would undertake a pan-European pilgrimage she headed for Rome with her followers and persuaded the Pope um, to join them. And after setting out for Cologne, uh, which was being besieged by the Huns, all the virgins were beheaded in a massacre. I think the Huns wanted to, uh, you know, uh, have them for wives, and they, they decided to say that they were married to Christ, pretty much like... Uh, to, to, to carry Tikawitha, uh, the native, right, that did the same thing. So the Hun leaders fatally shot Ursula with an arrow in about uh, 383 AD. There is only one church dedicated to St. Ursula in the United Kingdom. It is located in Wales. Okay, so it, it's crazy. It all goes back to Wales. It's nuts. But the fascinating thing about um, Ursula and the whole order of Ursula all ties into Canada and the United States because they were the first nuns to come over to start teaching the natives. 
in Quebec City. So they basically helped create the first church in Quebec City that was um, for the Roman Catholic Church. They also worked in Ireland and the United States. Uh, this, this red dot map here is showing where they were doing most of their work. So their, their convent was on Rue Saint Jacques Street in Paris. So, you know, Saint Jacques again, Jacques Cartier. And in 1825, the sisters and their boarding students relocated to Black Rock. So we're getting the word Black Rock into the <laughs> narrative. It's crazy. I don't know if you guys know about Black Rock. It's buying up all the real estate. Um, and so anyhow, it's just crazy. It just seems to be all significant to our timeline. Yeah, I forgot to mention our festival day is October 21st. So there's also the Straits of Magellan, um, which is in Cape Virgins. So it's all to do with the virgins, like uh, Virgin Islands is named after them. Um, and I already mentioned the 11,000 virgins of St. Pierre Island. And then also the church in Wales, they're saying here. And then the street in London called St. Mary's Axe is named after the church of St. Mary's Axe, originally dedicated to St. Mary the Virgin, St. Ursula, and the 11,000 virgins. Okay, and they also have relics of her. Um, so the White Lands College in Roehampton, London, the oldest educational institution of the Church of England has been under the patronage of St. Ursula since its formation. So that's wild. Anyhow, so yeah, so England, Wales, you know, Ireland, they're all worshiping her. So, but it's interesting because it comes back to the date, right, of her feast day, which is October 21st. And it's right when the sun is in Virgo, right by the Spica star, the Washington Monument star. So it's always tying back to the sky. Now, if you guys have been watching my channel for a long time, you know that I did a whole bunch of series of videos on bingo. And I did tie in this nun. Her name was Hildegard of Binging, composed many chants to honor Ursula. Okay, she was like um, a psychic nun, and she was getting downloaded with information, and she was getting downloaded with melodies, and then the priest didn't like it, um, you know, because she was so famous and healing people with this music. So you can listen to her, her songs, or you can go on YouTube and listen to um, her chants, but I didn't know that they were honoring Ursula. And then we have the Ursula in The Little Mermaid, right, which is a big storm, and, you know, it takes down ships in the sea and, you know, so it's like, it's crazy. It's like all tying in to the same theme of a storm at the sea because her, you know, she was brought to the shores of France with a storm on the sea. Venus is considered the woman in the sky because she goes from her conjunctions, the 50 day conjunction, which brings her into Lucifer stage. Uh, is the morning star, 263 days is approximately nine months. Then she goes to this eight to nine day birthing um, of Jesus, supposedly in antiquity. And then um, she goes again, this 263 days as the evening star. We know the importance of the Venus symbolism and the Venus five pointed star and how this is all relating to the birth of Jesus. Okay, so the eight days in antiquity where she goes into her um, superior uh, conjunction, uh, and she ends up turning into the black star, she comes out of her Lucifer stage, that is supposed to be the birth or the rebirth of Jesus, so the resurrection. Okay, so she, this is happening this year, on Ursula's feast day. Okay, she's turning into the black star. So she's called the black star because you can see her at night. Okay, so she's, you know, now in Hades, nighttime is Hades. And so she's now up in the sky at night and the sun is not around. So she's not being shown in the morning like she is when she's in the Lucifer stage when she's coming up before the sun. Okay, now she's the sun goes down and she's up in the sky all night long. Um, and so she's going into her black star stage. And of course it's happening on St. Ursula feast day. It's like, it's crazy. It's all in Virgo, right on the Washington Monument star, um, Spica. 
So they say eight days, but it really takes like about nine days. So here it is on October 17th. She's just starting to, um, you know, the orbits are going to the left. So she's just starting to go in front of the sun. And then you can see here on October 25th, she is actually, you know, in front of the sun now. And what is so cool about October 25th, we have Venus kissing the moon. Okay, so this is like super relevant. Okay, we're getting close to the Shambhala star, which is the heaven star at the bottom of the skirt of Virgo. So, you know, this is significant stuff, guys. It should start to be positive in our reality unless they keep trying to sabotage it with, you know, um, trauma, which like they create storms or whatever they're trying to do, create war, create storms. But I really think if you just don't um, connect to the trauma, like you just kind of just kind of let it flow through you and you don't really take any emotional attachment to it, you don't you don't add to it. OK, like you can start to like just temper it by your own energies how how you're how you're absorbing what's happening like i said i knew il de magdalene was a worship to our lady okay so they had this you know a statue there and it was all tied to um notre dame okay so i was like i couldn't believe i found it i was like oh my god it is there's you know the statues there which i, I just assumed there would be one so you guys remember the fire at Notre Dame de Paris uh, Cathedral in 2019. So I went, wanted to go into the history. I know there's some really intense history. It all ties to the Templars with this church, but it also ties into the French Revolution, which is basically citizens wanting to take control right, uh, over the elite. So there's lots of ties into this church and what the history was there. So in 1790, during the French Revolution, this is all when the founding of the United States was happening, eh? Notre Dame suffered some extensive desecration, such as religious imagery was damaged and destroyed. In the 19th century, the coronation of Napoleon I and the funerals of many of the French Republic's presidents took place at this cathedral. Okay, this is when they started to fight the kings and they wanted to have... Um, their own independence. So in 1831, publications of Victor Hugo's novel Notre Dame de Paris, known as The Hunchback of Notre Dame, inspired popular interest in the cathedral and led to a major restoration between 1844 and 1864. On August 26, 1944, the liberation of Paris from Germany occupation was celebrated at Notre Dame with singing of the Magnificent. Okay, so it's it has a lot to do with freedom. The cathedral is one of the most widely recognized symbols of the city of Paris and the French nation. They're saying some of the relics of uh, Christendom include the crown of thorns, a sliver of the true cross, and a nail from the true cross. And on April 15, 2019, Notre Dame was undergoing re renovation and restoration. Its roof caught on fire and burnt for 15 hours. And supposedly there was a Templar walking up in the rafters. I don't know if you guys remember that, but there was pictures of him walking around in the rafters. So you can see here the significance of Napoleon in 1801. In 1804, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte crowns himself Emperor of Notre Dame. And that was all because the French Revolution, you know, because the French were supporting the Patriots and then their country went into bankruptcy and then the citizens got mad and then they basically said you, the king was still living like everything was normal, but they were all starving to death. And Marie Antoinette, his wife, you know, got, you know, said that she didn't care about them or they could go eat cake or whatever if they if they were starving, which she supposedly never said. And then they murdered them, right? The citizens of France murdered the king and, and uh, Marie Antoinette. So anyhow, that's part of the history. It's basically uh, the citizens taking back control from the elite is all tied into that church. Now, this is crazy because Christianity in France, a Galo Roman temple dedicated to Jupiter, stood on the site of Notre Dame. This is why I'm bringing it all in. It's all because of this, because of Jupiter um, and the relevance of what's happening with Jupiter. 
uh, today and also you know the it hasn't happened for you know 60 years since this has happened or 59 years and then you know this whole thing with the olympics that's happening in france in 2024 it's all relevant to this church okay everything's connected Evidence from this include the Pillar of the Boatmen, discovered beneath the cathedral in 1710. In the 4th and 5th century, a large early Christian church, the Cathedral of St. Etienne, was built on the site, close to the royal palace. The entrance was situated about 40 meters west of the present west front of Notre Dame. So Tarvars... Trigonius is the divine figure who appears on the relief panel of the pillar of the boatman as the bull with three cranes perched on his back. He stands under a tree and on an adjacent panel the god Isis is chopping down a tree, possibly a willow with an axe. So Taurus is the bull, right? It's the Taurus constellation. And they're talking about Eos, which is basically Jesus. And I'll show you how they're referring to it as, as Jesus. Here's a picture of the whole complete pillar. And I don't think they've ever found anything else like this underneath any uh, church or cathedral before. A well-known section in the Lucans refers to gory sacrifices offered to the triad of the Celtic deities, Tutas, Hesus, and Tyrannus. Various spelling or readings of the same Isis in the manuscripts of Lucan include Hesus, Asus, and Hesus. Among a pair of later commentators of the Lucan work, one deity, Tutus, with Mercury, and Isis with Mars. So they're basically saying Jesus is Mars. According, um, there's a human victims were sacrificed to Isis by being led to a tree and flogged to death. And so, and then here he is, he's cutting down the tree. So Jesus is cutting down the tree to say, I don't want my, you know, to be sacrificed to. He doesn't want, to, you know, people to die. So I think in the Bible, it also says Jesus was cutting down a tree. So here they're saying the similarity of the last name to Aesis, which is Welsh for Jesus, is obvious and striking. So they're saying here there's two sculptures uh, where Isis appeared on the Pillar of the Boatmen from among the Parisi, on which Isis is identified by name. Okay, so they're also saying here, uh, like I said before, that he's with the bull and the three cranes. Jupiter, Vulcan, and other gods. So they have Vulcan there as well. He is the husband of Venus, right, that tried to capture uh, Mars with Venus when she was having an affair with him. So now they're saying Jesus is Mars. So, it's, you know, Mars is the crown chakra. It's Aries. It's the Lamb of God. So, yeah, he is Mars in a way, but he really is. I also see him as Neptune. Neptune, because he's uh, Neptune's metaphysical. He also likes to uh, sacrifice himself, you know, to for the good of others, you know. So um, that also ties into Jesus. Now, back to present day, the task of stabilizing the building, this is Notre Dame, against possible collapse was completed in November 2020 and reconstruction began 2021. The government of France has said it hopes that the reconstruction can be completed by the spring of 2024, the year of the Olympics, um, in Paris. So President Emmanuel Macron confirmed on 14th of April, 2021, the cathedral site will be formally returned to the church on April 15th, 2024, and that the first mass since the fire will be held in the cathedral nave on that day, even if the reconstruction has not been finished by then. Okay, so there's this significance of mid-April, right? What, what's going on with mid-April? Yeah, I just wanted to remind you guys that this is the church that has the big rose stained glass window. And supposedly the 
the uh, cymatics of the sound in that church create this window. Okay, so it's all like it's a sacred site. It's obviously, obviously there's ley lines running through this place for it to always be sacred, even from pagan religion right through to Roman Catholic religion. So that's really fascinating. Um, and the rose represents DNA, right? So that's why this church is so important. Now, this is what was happening in the sky when it went on fire. So Mars was in Taurus. It's almost, yeah, it's almost, almost by the left eye, which is the Ein star. Okay, so the Ein being the Ein soft, it's like, you know, the top of the tree of life on the Kabbalah tree. So Mars was there. Venus and Mercury were conjunct right on the circlet of Pisces, which is the right hand fish of Pisces, which I do believe is the crown of Christ. And then Jupiter was in the Golden Gate. And the sun is exactly right between uh, the two fish. So that's where April 15th is. It's not in Aries. It's really, you're right in the V of the two fish tied together, which is Venus and Cupid, right? That's, that's they're riding those two fish or the two dolphins and they're tied together, um, which is love, Venus with love, right? So that's right in between. But it's also the victory symbol, which, you know, is your index, index finger and your third finger, which is Venus, uh, sorry, Saturn and Jupiter. Jupiter is your index finger. So Jesus always holds those two fingers together, right? They're not separate. So that's also another fascinating part of the, the hand gesture of the, the peace symbol. You know, is that good or bad? You know, it's hard to know. I think... Uh, I, I would assume it's not good. It means you're separate from yourself. You, you don't have yourself joined together in your root chakras, which is what Saturn and Jupiter rule. You want your root chakra to be strong. You want them to be together. The name Paris originated from the earliest inhabitants of the Paris region, the Paris Sea tribe. That's what they were talking about with this pagan site, with this pillar, uh, the boatman pillar. The city is also known as La Ville Lumière, meaning the city of light, because it was the first big city on the continent to have gas street lighting. It was also played a major role in the era of enlightenment. The city streets and boulevards were illuminated by 56,000 gas lamps in 1857. Interesting the number five and six, because that's the numbers of our DNA, right? Um, which is also the hex and the pent. Okay, so six-sided or five-sided. The hex, actually, Dan Winter says, is when you hex somebody, it's actually, it's not shareable, and pent is shareable. Okay, so the city has been referred to as Pan Am. So the word Pan Am, they have it here as Pan Ami, is a slang name for Paris. Its origin is controversial. So there's a historian who wrote Je me souviens de Paris, which is I remember Paris, which is the, the, the name on our license plate in Quebec. They changed it to I, Je me souviens, which is I remember. Okay, so they want us to remember in Quebec what the origin of, you know, the history is. It's, it's like, don't forget your history. Okay, so it's also saying here that he's saying it had to do with a, a Panama scandal with uh, hats and something, but I don't believe that's what it is. I think it goes back to the etymology. First of it's all, it's pan, which is the, the pagan for, you know, the pan god, which is uh, to do with freedom, okay? I know everybody thinks that he's like, this is, you know, it's the devil, but it's not. It's to do with freedom. I've done videos on pan before, like Peter Pan. He's the original green man. Okay, the jolly green giant, he's Pan. He's the guy that wants you to connect to nature and become free. But they change his color to red, and that's, you know, called him the devil. In slang, Pan Am means a dreamy girl or a peak woman. So back to the feminine again. So Ami, the second half of the word Pan Ami, is soul. So it's, you have a Pan soul. Basically, you have a soul that connects to nature. 
The city is named after the Parisi tribe that inhabited the region from the mid third century BC. The Parisi traded with the numerous river towns. The Romans conquered the Paris basin in 52 BC and built the city known as Lutetia Parisiorum, or Lutetia is short. The town became a prosperous city with amphitheaters, theaters, temples, baths, and forums. The, the town was referred to as Parisius by the time the Roman Empire was ending. Parisius is the Latin term that became Paris later. Paris became the city's official name after Clovis and Frank made it the capital of his kingdom in 508 AD. So they're explaining here the ancient trade route between the Germania and the Hispania existed at this area which is Paris, by way of the meeting of the Oise, the Marne rivers, and the Seine. Okay, so these are really important rivers. And this Seine River is right beside the Notre Dame, right? The cathedral. And I know David Bowie, I think he proposed to his wife on this river. And then um, the Obamas, or um, I think uh, Michelle Obama was there when the Notre Dame Cathedral was burning. She was on a boat ride there, you know, so it's it's really <laughs> crazy. It's all tying in, okay? They want you to know the history of this area and what it represents. So here's the map of Paris, and you can see Notre Dame Cathedral. I circled it, like, with um, a light blue there. And then St. Morris is where the Marne River joins the Seine. And then the Oise River is up where the other pink circle is up where it joins the Seine. So the tribe of the Parisi lived on the Seine River. And so it's interesting that the cathedral is kind of in between these two, um, you know, confluences of the, of the river of Seine. So it's, and you notice that the cathedral is like right in the middle of a circle of roads here. It's like they've put it right in the center and the Eiffel Tower is just off to the left. Fascinating. So I guess uh, St. Ursula, you know, her husband was from Amurica. So it, this is all tying into the Seine River as well in the Brittany Peninsula. And this would be the whole Amerika, all in brown representing you know wales um really is all part of wales there and going up into scotland and the tip of france right it's in gaul so there you go that's the celtic empire america so do you think america is named after that i'm assuming they were a wealthy tribe they had money coins uh, gold coins this is one with a horse on it from the first century BC. Now, here's some etymology coming back to Wales. So the meaning of the Parisi or the Peri or the commanders, that's the Welsh verb Peri means commander, also fighters. So even the word, you know, is, is to do with freedom. That's why Paris, I guess, was all tied to freedom. The perio, it's also known as the cauldron that translates parasi as they are, they of the cauldron, which is like, what's the cauldron? It's like the cup where the liquid is in. It's like, you know, is that where the eternal <laughs> fountain of youth is, you know, in the cauldron? So, or the nectar of the gods is in the cauldron. So it's all tying in. So this is why the Olympics in 2024 are being held in Paris. And the French, the Brittany were Celtic. They tied, they fought with the Welsh and the Irish and the Scottish, all against the English. So the Parisi were a British Celtic tribe. So this is, so this ties in, right? Located somewhere within the present day East Riding of Yorkshire in England, known from the single brief reference by Ptolemy in his Geographia. So that's where they were up there in the northern part. It's known as Feely Bay. 
So then they're saying here in 1857, the foundations of the 4th century Roman signal station were discovered at the Carnes Cliff edge on Feely Brig at the northern end of Feely Bay. The structure is 50 meters long with a square tower 14 meters wide, a defensive ditch and ramparts from a later era. Excavations at the time of the find were subsequently in uh, 1920 and 1990 uncovered Roman pottery and hordes of coins. The site is protected, scheduled monument. So yeah, so there you go. And they're there, but it's like it's they they must have been working together. You know this tribe. Uh, you know I don't know how old they're saying fourth century Roman, and the other was first century. Maybe they moved to the you know the UK. I don't know this this tribe. It's fascinating. So, but I do think it all ties into, um, you know the the pagan worship that was going on in Paris. It's basically they were worshiping the pan, the green man. So 2024, April 8th, we have the Great American Eclipse that is going to be going across the U.S. and it will be causing um, the total uh, darkness right across south of Montreal, right through the Magdalen Islands, right exactly where Fiona hit. Okay, it's all going to be going across there. And, you know, I just think there's relevance to this. Okay, they, they're tying, this eclipse is tying the energy to Paris because the trajectory of the eclipse goes right across the Atlantic to Paris, France. Then in May, just a little bit over a month later, Jupiter, Venus, the Sun, uh, and Uranus are all in Taurus okay, by the Pleiades. And this is really relevant because it's all tying into that pillar that is in Notre Dame because it's to do with Taurus and Jupiter. Um, and I just really think this is all significant to what's going to happen. And May 21st is all tying into May Day and Victoria Day. In Canada, we celebrate Victoria Day which is supposedly for Queen Victoria. On Trump's birthday, June 14th in 2024, the sun, right, is on the Crab Nebula, which all ties into the crab, which is the divine feminine, the moon, right, the, the Cancer constellation. And that was where the first sound ever came from that was recorded, was from that nebula. It's right on... Uh, in between the horns of Taurus, which is super significant, okay, and that's the worshipping of the bull. The sun is there, and then Venus and Mercury are conjunct the sun, and Jupiter is on the exact line. See the red line that I put from the Sirius star, the dog star, right through the Orion's belt, which ties to the Egyptian pyramids. That's where they're all built to, because that's the line of the duat in Egyptian mythology. That's the path of your soul has to go through to be judged by God. And Jupiter, God, is right there in Taurus on the Pleiades. Okay, this, this is super significant, what's happening in 2024. So I guess that's why they decided that they were going to use the Jupiter symbol for the 2024 Olympics. So Mars, which is Jesus, according to their pillar of the boatman at the Notre Dame Church, Mars is on the hand of God, which is the head of Sittus. It's in Aries, which is the crown chakra, which it rules. Okay? It's fire. Lamb of God, and this is still on Trump's birthday. They're already talking about the Olympic opening ceremony uh, on the Seine River. It's saying it will take place, is what the Paris police chief says. The opening ceremony for the Paris 2024 Olympics uh, will be the largest ever held in history of the Games. It will be open to all local residents from Paris and its regions, along with visitors from 
over France and over around the world. A ceremony designed for and by athletes. Athletes will be in the heart and soul of the ceremony. So yeah, it's going to be crazy. They're saying um, it's going to be magical. Nothing short of magical. Its staging will be groundbreaking. It will be a ceremony for the people, open to one and all. It is to show the world the very best of France, a party like no other, and the world is invited. The opening day is happening on July 26, 2024, and it closes on August 11th. 88. Double infinity. And August 11th is when the sun is between the two pillars. Okay, so we've got the balance of the fire and the water. The sun is right between Leo and Cancer. Now, the pillar of the boatmen were uh, worshipping the three Celtic gods as Mercury, Mars, and Jupiter. So Mercury is on the regular star, which is the crown uh, in Leo. It's known as the fixed star of Leo. It is represents a crown in alchemy. And yeah, it's like basically you're alchemized yourself uh, by, by your mind. Mercury rules your mind. It also rules communication. And he's the messenger of the gods. And the other two gods, Mars and Jupiter, that are represented by that pagan pillar, are in the Silver Gate of Isis, the Divine Feminine of Taurus, because Venus rules Taurus, Earth sign, um, and they're conjunct, like right in the Silver Gate. Amazing. And you got to remember, the Silver Gate is where the two eclipses cross at St. Louis in the United States. So. This is why the Silver Gate is so important. And, uh, you know, the eclipse had just gone through in April, and this is in August. Now, the moon, your emotions, are in Shambhala. And that's what's happening on the closing ceremonies of these Olympics. The opening ceremonies, the moon, is in Pisces, you know, which is religion, spiritual. Uh, right between the two fish. And Uranus is right by the Pleiades, which it happens to do with heaven and the Pleiades. And, you know, this can also be changing, earth changing, because Uranus causes like a change and, you know, Taurus is earth. But it can also be your toroidal field, right? It's changing. Mars is there on the Einsof, um, on the left eye of Taurus, and Jupiter is there in the Silver Gate. The sun is going to be right on Cancer, on the Beehive Cluster, which is really the manger of Christ. And it's going to tone down the sun because the sun, when it's in Cancer, is less egotistical. It has a softening, a, a more of a feeling of emotions. Venus, love, is between the two uh, pillars of Leo and Cancer. And yet, like I said before, Mercury is on Rex, uh, the regular star in Leo. I know that's two years away, but I just thought it was super significant with the, what happened with Fiona, hurricane, and uh, just, you know, things come to me. I just have to get them out to you guys when they come. So here um, on St. Ursula's feast day, right, which is super important, Mars, which now we know is Jesus, is in conjunct with the Crab Nebula uh, in the Silver Gate. Right, which is on the Hammer of Orion. This is an important place. Uh, it's where the Milky Way crosses. Okay, so that's why it's so important. It crosses at the Golden Gate, um, right beside Scorpio and Sagittarius, like in Ophiuchus, and then it crosses here. So this is a very significant spot in the sky, um, and it ties into the you know the cardinal points with the equatorial grid. Okay, so anyhow. We've got things to look forward to um, with the sun being uh, in Virgo right now. It's very um, spiritual and very significant. And I hope you guys can uh, join up for my classes. I'm going to be doing a class all on the orbits. And the reason that I wanted to do this class was because I wanted to give you guys all the math 
of all the orbit cycles, the retrograde cycles, the return cycles, basically the patterns so that you have them in hard copy, right? So you're not use, waiting for the computer to tell you because I really think it's important. I really do think that we're supposed to know this stuff like the back of our hands and we're supposed to have the ability to use it, right? And if you are like in a situation where we don't have the internet, case of a solar flare or whatever, it takes down the grid, you still have the information, okay? Because it's important because you know when to do something and when not to do something in regards to the planetary positions. And if you don't have any electronic devices, you'll have the numbers, you'll have the ability to know by looking up at the sky and figuring things out. And this is how they did it, right? Back in the day, when they were creating clocks with the planets, it was all just done by numbers. They didn't have a computer. So I just want to give you guys that information because I don't think that is easily, um, you know, uh, available. Like it takes, you know, a lot of research to put that all together. So I'm going to do that for you. And then you'll have that um, and, and you'll always have that as reference for the future. So slowly we're getting through all the, the classes. I'm doing them every two weeks. And you can come and access them whenever you want afterwards, after they're done, if, you, if you're not able to join the live class. Uh, but the great part about joining the live class is you can ask questions after and we can talk about things. Um, and if you're not interested in the discussion after, you can always just sign out and just listen to the class. It's up to you. But this is um, probably a little bit um, the last class that's doing with the mechanics of everything. I did a mythology class. There was a mythology class. but we're going to get really into the, um, you know, the alchemic meaning of astrology and how it all ties into the Kabbalah tree. That's a big, huge class. And also matching the Greek letters and the Hebrew letters and understanding how to use astrology is really kind of where we're going um, in these classes so that you can start to use it to help self heal and also to know yourself better and to know your family members better and to know uh, when, what time is a good time to do something and when it's not, you know, you want to be able to use your astrology, not just wait for somebody else to interpret it for you, because there's a lot of people interpreting it through, um, uh, how the sky used to be, not with what's happening now. And you can tell, I hope by watching my channel, you can see that the elites are using sidereal astrology. Yes, they do use some tropical in, you know, because of the tropic of cancer, tropic of, uh, Capricorn being, you know, in antiquity, they're using some of the symbolism, but in general, when they want to plan something, they're using sidereal astrology. And I hope that is clear to you by showing you um, exactly how they've aligned events and dates um, to different uh, sky placements. So by this time, if you've been watching my channel for as long as I've been doing it, you would know that. But um, if you're new to the channel, you can go back and look at stuff that I've done and you can see that it's always aligning to the sky with relevance. Okay, so sign up for the class uh, or sign up for some of the classes, what you feel like you want to, uh, you know, brush up on or if you want to really dig deep. Um, I appreciate your support. These, these videos take me hours. This is taking me all day to put this together. I know it's crazy, but I'm passionate about it, and I want you guys to um, to understand how wonderful we are to be alive at this time. Okay, it's very exciting, and I do believe that that they want us to have that freedom in our hearts. Okay, it's not about fighting for it with anger; it's about uh, making it happen through your mind. Okay, and really creating the new world inside yourself and project it outward and it has to be done with love it can't be done with strife and that's what Acadia was Acadia was harmony okay and it was wonderful um yeah they destroyed it because we have to go back and remember what it was and bring it back to life okay and that's really what our mission is as people that are awake okay it's not about being angry and getting frustrated with people that are in awakening you just need to work on yourself and work on the projection and the visualization of what you want in the future. And if it's for us to just hold on to memory, you need to have this knowledge so that you can come back with it. If you need to, you know, if you're, if we're time traveling, you need to have this knowledge to be powerful in, in the future. 
okay? And this is, if you don't understand how, the, how everything works in the sky, you're, you're, you're just winging it, right? So you want to really have that, this base knowledge to, to learn how to use astrology to, to your advantage. So just signing out. List you guys. Bye.